or perhaps I should say good morning, Ms. Edwina Hogadon, Dean Emeritus of the College of Business and of the School of Retailing. What I would like to chat with you about this morning uh, is what I have chosen to call the oral history of the Institute and because of the extremely important part that you had to play during the time that you were here, I would like to have you reminisce a bit about your experiences at RIT from the early 30s up until the present time. Uh, in particular, I would like to know a little bit about the students, about the faculty, and some of the principal administrative people, the sorts of things that you did first as a faculty member in the School of Retailing and later as Dean of the College of Business. In other words, uh, why don't you just consider me as a newcomer to the Rochester scene and you bring me up to date about the uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. All right, go yes, ahead. Yes, yes, thank you very much, let, Dr. Let, Smith. Let's just, all right, now you're on the air. Fine enough. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Smith. If there's one thing I enjoy talking about, it certainly is the Rochester Institute of Technology, where I spent about 37 years of my life, and the uh, Institute is still very close to me, and I think a great deal of it. You were asking me to comment a bit about some of these 37 years, and without taking your entire tape, let me just highlight a few of the reminiscences that I can pass on to you. Of course, coming in the 30s, as I did, to Rochester and an outsider coming into the Rochester scene, I found that about the first thing we had to do here was to uh, gain the confidence of the, of the local people in the kind of work we were doing at RIT. Uh, most of them at that time thought of us as a little vocational school on Plymouth Avenue. And while uh, people were not against us, I'm not so sure they were for us either. And they had to get acquainted with us as people before they could really think too much about the kinds of programs we were doing. So those early days were spent not only developing and sharpening up uh, the kinds of programs we were offering, all of them were diploma programs, of course, under the direction of Dr. Charters and then later Dr. Tyler, uh, but also uh, working in the community to gain acceptance and to gain the confidence of the folks who were, uh, shall we say at that time, quote, the establishment, quote, uh, of our Rochester area. Well, now you came in the fall of 1931 yes. as a faculty member in the, in the, in the, in the retailing, retailing department. And I must say that I came with some reluctance because I had always said that one thing I would never be in my life would be a school teacher. And I turned out to be one rather early. I came from Pittsburgh and came to be a member of the faculty in retailing, which at that time uh, was starting to develop their programs along the uh, functional idea of Dr. Charters. About how many faculty were there at that time? And who was the head of the department? Well, uh, Georgiana Hathaway was the head of the department, and uh, we had on our faculty uh, approximately, uh, well, I think perhaps about four or five people. Gertrude Sykes was one of my early friends on the faculty and a, a real staunch supporter. Then, of course, we had many faculty who taught uh, other courses like uh, English communications and uh, public speaking and this kind of thing. But we were a close-knit group, and we worked closely together in the development of our courses. We had a lot of coursework to do, and sometimes we felt it was quite a burden to have to do all that and teach at the same time. At that time, the co-op program was just beginning to emerge as a, an important uh, part of the total program. And we had students who uh, came to school in the morning and left at 11 to go to work in the Rochester stores and came back at 2 o'clock uh, to take courses from then until 5. We had those kinds of students. And then we had the students who were in classes for a four-week period and then disappeared for four weeks and went out on their co-op job. So you see, it was sort of like juggling balls in the air. <laughs> it must have been a bit hectic. <laughs> yes, it really was. And, and there, I must admit, there were days when you weren't sure whether you were teaching salesmanship or merchandise information to one group or the other. But it was still a lot of fun. Now, when did the uh, retailing department start? Well, hmm. the retailing department itself, of course, began in 1923. 23, yes. And uh, the program at first was a four-year program. Hmm. We had our first graduate, a girl, in 1927. 
and uh, we hear from her from time to time. Of course, like all girls, she got married and raised a family, and I'm sure is a good member of her community. Uh, but it was really in 1931 that we uh, worked very hard on starting our co-op program. And uh, we began then to place uh, students outside of the city, and we had them in Buffalo, for example. Hangers there was the first store. And there they worked for four weeks, and then they came back for four weeks. So uh, we had uh, this kind of development in the early 30s, the development of the programs, uh, the curricula to meet the objectives which we had set up for ourselves and which had been checked out by people active in the field and our peers among the educational world. And uh, then we had the problem of working with the uh, employers. Let me say that unlike today, employers were not so crazy about having co-op students either. In the first place, it was not a period of great economic growth and uh, the question of budgeting and so forth, so that uh, we had a lot of worries along that line, a lot of worries of placement. Of course, you were right into the depth of the Depression Indeed, also. we Indeed, we were, and we were in the depth of the Depression several ways. Uh, first of all, with regard to the placement of our students on co-op jobs and also the problem of, of keeping the Institute budget in line, too, and I well recall uh, which I'm sure many people won't believe today, that we took, all of us, a large cut in salary in those early 30s, just so we could keep all the faculty working. Very good. Now, you stayed at the Institute about three years, and then yeah. you went to... then I went back to uh, store work again, and I went out to Milwaukee, uh, where I stayed for several years in the personnel department of one of the large stores there. And then uh, I heard from Mr. Randall, who was president, of course, of the Institute when I was there first, and still then was, and uh, he wrote and said that uh, uh, he was going to, Miss Hathaway would be leaving in another year, and he wondered if I wouldn't be interested in coming back to the Institute and understudying her uh, to be head of the department. We met in Chicago and discussed this matter, and finally I agreed to do this, and uh, I was to come back in August of uh, 1936, and uh, Miss Hathaway then would show me the ropes and I'd be running the department uh, after a year. Well, I returned to find that uh, she had married Mr. Randall in the summer interim, and uh, that she was no longer there, and that I was running the department that <laughs> first year with uh, Dr. Ellingson uh, going into the position of acting president. And I recall uh, that this was a, really a real big switch for me and uh, quite upsetting. However, Dr. Ellingson assured me that he thought I could do the job. And during that first year, I will always remember that I met with him once a week to go over my problems of the week and to discuss the ways in which they could be solved. He was a great help to me during that time. Uh, so that uh, coming in then was, uh, was a very uh, interesting experience for me. Well. After, uh, of course, I came in as head of the department, I had some faculty who had been with me there as uh, fellow faculty members, but we didn't, this really was no great problem. People in those days, and I presume they are today, it was sort of all for one and one for all, and uh, the fact that I was head of the department did not seem to create too many difficulties. Now, let's see, what were the other areas of the Institute at that time? Well, of course, at that time, there was the uh, electrical and mechanical and the art department and the food administration department. And uh, you see, I think the um, photographic department was beginning to emerge mm -hmm. as a very important part of our program. And later, of course, publishing and printing came in and uh, so on. Uh, so that uh, we began then to acquire a few more departments as the years went on. Of course, we got to the end of the 30s and into the 40s, uh, we, uh, we got right into the World War II years. And uh, that was a real rough time because, of course, our men were going out to service and uh, being drafted. So that the day school enrollment really became that of the food administration and the retailing departments, where the girls were, so to speak, although they were not easy to work with either because they were wanted to be where the boys were and they weren't there. But uh, with the war programs that we ran for all the war plants in Rochester 24 hours a day and with these efforts and with the small enrollments we had in the daytime, uh, we still managed to keep our heads above water. Then Dr. Ellingson, uh, developed the idea of post-war planning committees, and we were 
were all assigned to different committees. And uh, we, we talked about what we could do when that war was over. So I remember being <coughs> established in about 1944. That's right, that's right. And uh, we, probably the most exciting thing that happened on uh, the committee I was on was the recommendation we made, uh, C. B. Noblet was chairman, I remember, that we changed the name of the Institute. And uh, this was really rank heresy. Some of us thought we'd, we'd run right out of town, but we weren't. And of course, the name of the Institute did become the Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, we also made other plans during that time, but I firmly remember a point that Dr. Ellingson made. He said that we have to plan so well in these committees, but he said that well, what we can do when the war is over. But remember, the day that the armistice is declared, Main Street is going to look just the same as the day before. Uh, so uh, uh, things are not going to be that different. It's going to be a gradual change, and, and certainly it turned out to be that way. But as we moved in then to the late 40s, and the war then did, as we all know, end, uh, we came into the 50s, and I look upon this as a period when we were able to build on the foundations that we had developed in the 30s and 40s, curriculum-wise, for instance. We were able to organize ourselves to get ready uh, for application uh, to uh, give the associate degree. Now, I think it was in 52, was it not? We gave the first degree. Uh, during this period, we'd had many visitors. The Institute had developed a number of, of course, the functional approach for curriculum development under Dr. Charters was something that many visitors were interested in. The uh, work we were doing in cooperative employment was, was still another area. Uh, the evaluation of our student work. At that time, we were using statement grades. Uh, all of these attracted other educators to RIT so that we had many people coming through. Uh, also, we had, of course, uh, problems in getting ready uh, for uh, organizing our work into the associate degree uh, program. <clears throat> now, rapidly on the top of the associate degree program, there followed the baccalaureate. That's right. So then we had the question of how we were going to build for the baccalaureate programs on the, uh, the associate program. And uh, they became more or less the base. And that's when we went into the first two years full time in school and the last two years, at least this is the way we worked in our college, uh, for co-op. And it worked out very well that way. We felt that the students going in as freshmen uh, on co-op were a little immature for it. And that by the time they were juniors or third year students, uh, they really were ready for the co-op work experience and it enabled us to expand the placement from that first town of Buffalo, New York uh, to as far west as Chicago, as far east as New York, as far south in one or two cases as Miami, Florida. We also uh, found that no longer could the uh, supervisors, as we were known uh, earlier, uh, handle the co-op placement as well as all the other administrative details. And so we developed within our areas what we call coordinators of cooperative employment. And those were the uh, people who had the responsibility for placement and for follow-up. Other schools with this work programs, uh, we found, did not follow up as closely on the work of the students when they were on co-op job as, as we attempted to do. We thought this was the strength of our program. Now, another uh, development, as I remember, was that uh, the departments were pulled together in several divisions. Indeed they were. And, uh, in your area? <laughs> yes. I think we had about the longest name of any division. Sounded like a law firm. We were the Division of Business, Food Administration, and Retailing. Uh, so that uh, we then had all three as well. Uh, I became division chairman, perhaps because of the fact that uh, the head of the business area was about to retire soon, and uh, the head of the, uh, the food department almost likewise. And so it seemed as though uh, perhaps the uh, I was the natural to become division chairman. Do you want to expand a little bit on the, this business uh, department? Because uh, that came to us as a new department, is that? Oh, yes. You mean the business administration? Yes. Yes. Uh, there was a good deal of discussion about that. The McKechnie Lemger School had been a school of commerce here in Rochester and well thought of, too. It's a proprietary school. That's a proprietary school. So we had, uh, uh, when they joined us, uh, we really had uh, some new problems that we hadn't had before. In the first place, like many proprietary schools, they had a great proliferation of courses. 
and uh, we had to uh, study their program and to reduce the number of offerings and to consolidate and coordinate and uh, almost take it and wipe it area in order to get ready for this evaluation. Actually, I think the idea of the MSA evaluation is excellent because it does uh, make everybody do a lot of self searching and uh, evaluating of themselves as well as of their programs. Now let me see, after the uh, MSA... Immediately following yes. the MSA accreditation, uh, the college developed and expanded, That's as right. I remembered, under your leadership. Well, we did grow, and at that time, I think, uh, shortly after that, we became uh, colleges at RIT with the deans. And uh, I think here, we began to feel a sense of oneness somehow. I mean, we had been reporting in the early years to Dr. Ellingson, who had many, many responsibilities. Now we were able to report to the vice president in charge of academic affairs, yourself. And uh, here we felt uh, a closeness. Uh, we felt here was somebody who could devote their entire time and attention uh, to the problems of the academic function of the institute while our president, with his broader uh, responsibilities, uh, would be released then to uh, fulfill them much more adequately. And, and I do think that it tightened up the administrative process. And while uh, as deans we had our differences, we still helped each other a great deal uh, in, our, in our regular meetings that we had together. Now, as, <coughs> pardon me, as dean of the College of Business, you also wore another hat. The yes. director of the uh, School of Retail. That's right. Uh, somewhere along about this time, with the retirement of uh, Mr. Stauffer from the uh, uh, School of Business, uh, as I remember, uh, Dr. Jerry Young came on as director of that School of Business Administration. Well, no, Leo, uh, not uh, Dr. Young, but Dr. Scott. You're right. Ralston Scott. <laughs> and uh, he came to us. Um, to head up the Business Administration School and was with us, I think, four or five years. I don't recall just exactly how long. But uh, he then uh, was, well, and Ms. Hurley, of course, was head of Food Administration, and I wore the two hats as director of the School of Retailing and uh, dean of the college. We, uh, then Dr. Scott left us and uh, was followed then by Dr. Jerry Young, who came to us from Washington University. And I always th thought it was interesting that when we were first seeking someone to replace Mr. Stauffer, of course at that time, it was the early part of the uh, 50s, I believe, uh, people didn't know us too well around the countryside. But after that, uh, and uh, we were able then to employ Dr. Scott, but after he left us, we found that we had grown to be known by more people. And so, uh, replacing Dr. Scott was not as great a problem as it was establishing him in the first place. That's right. <coughs> uh, that reminds me of another question I've had in mind. What uh, is your recollection of the attitude of the community over the years towards RIT? Has this changed? Oh yes, mind? I think it has. I think, it, it, I think it's grown a great deal. I think it, uh, that people now know us uh, I was amused one day to read in the paper that RIT's Miss Hogadon was going to retire. And I don't think that would ever appear in the paper in 1934. Nobody would have cared or known who I was. But uh, I do think that as a result of some of us uh, pushing in the community, being willing to do those extra hours of community service, simply because most of us like to do it anyway, uh, but because we wanted to get the Institute known I think that today, uh, people that are working there are able to take advantage of this groundwork and uh, move ahead in the community. I hope they will do more of it. Uh, I, I know that the, Dr. Miller does, but I would hope that we would see more of it uh, on the part of faculty members. How would you characterize the student body in the early days, in the first few years you were here, uh, compared to the student body of it's about the time of your return? Well, I think the student body in the early days were more inclined to accept uh, the uh, programs as they were set up and to feel that the people that had planned them had had experience and knowledge and uh, that therefore they were probably what they should be learning. They still did question 
uh, because of the fact that the students were co-ops, you see, uh, which meant that uh, they were out in the world of work. And so if what you were teaching in the classroom uh, didn't seem to them to be very uh, practical or related to their work. Uh, they were very quick to question it. Uh, but on the other hand, I think they questioned it in a less uh, violent mood than the students, uh, the later students later on. Uh, however, I have a, a great affection for the students of the 60s and uh, the, uh, well, it would be the 60s with me since I retired at 70, uh, because I feel that the great thing there was they wanted somebody to listen to them. Uh, they just didn't necessarily expect that there would be a solution from that listening, uh, but they wanted people to feel among the faculty and among the administration uh, that at least they would listen to them and listen to their ideas. We established in our uh, college quite early uh, a little group of students that we called the coffee uh, group uh, where they met with the administrators of the college and uh, representatives of the student body that is, and uh, met with us regularly and had a chance to express to us uh, some of the feelings of their uh, constituency. And we had also an opportunity to, uh, to explain some of the reasons why we were doing it. Then we also felt in our college that we ought to recognize the students who are doing things well. Sometimes we thought that we spent all our time with those that were on probation, but this was not the case, of course. So we uh, had a, uh, a luncheon uh, once every quarter for the uh, students who had been uh, on the, the dean's list, and we honored them. We also brought in top administrative officers at RIT, because one time I heard a student say, that he had never been in my office all the time he'd been at RIT. This is a, a student on the dean's list. Now, this is unfortunate. Uh, so that we developed things of this kind uh, to be working more in harness with the students rather than to be working above them and supervising. Well, it was certainly true that you were always extremely sensitive to the feelings of the students and the faculty as well. And speaking of the faculty, uh, what about the changing uh, type of faculty that we had and the changing attitudes of the faculty. Yes, I think uh, I think faculty have changed down through the years. Of course, when you have a small group, as we had in the 30s and early 40s, and when you have the, the great world problems that were going on during that time, like the Depression and World War II, and we still have many problems, we know that, uh, it tended to draw us more closely together. We were a smaller group. Then, uh, as you grow larger, uh, then I think you grow uh, a little different direction. I think the faculty today have become uh, quite uh, uh, academic-minded, and uh, that uh, if someone hasn't uh, just had all the education that uh, they feel they themselves have had, then they really look a little bit uh, with uh, askance at those faculty members. But uh, in the early days, it was the experience in the field plus the ability to to uh, share that with the students that was terribly important. Today it seems to be uh, the, uh, the academic uh, education of the faculty member uh, more than, uh, than experience in the field uh, that is the highlight uh, of faculty. I still think faculty are very much interested in the students and, and I enjoy the faculty, but I think they have become uh, much more uh, regimented in their, their views. Well, now I'm glad to have those reactions to the faculty. Here's another question. Uh, what do you think the impact of the School of Retailing and the College of Business uh, has been upon the Rochester community? And what do you think the impact of the community has been upon the uh, college and upon the School of Retailing? Well, of course, as far as the College of Business is concerned, one way, of course, you can measure your success is how well your graduates are, are doing and how well they're accepted in the community uh, when uh, and also of course during some of the financial campaigns we've had uh, we were able to find out whether uh, our uh, friends in the community will put their money where their words are and we found that uh, we had pretty good success in the last campaign with the uh, local uh, merchants i think that we were just becoming known nationally uh, around uh, well when i retired at 70 and i don't know how much more has been done on that since i left i, I feel that you cannot uh, just depend upon Monroe County uh, for your friends. You've got to make them all over the, the countryside. So uh, the impact of the College of Business 
I think as, as we have sent graduates into the community and as they have done well, and just the other day I learned that more, I think 13 of our uh, CPA candidates uh, we were able to pass the CPA exam, good. Uh, which is very good. And of course our dietetic uh, graduates have been accepted for the internships of the Dietetic Association. Our retailing graduates uh, today uh, are in positions of uh, supervision and uh, responsibility in the various firms in which they're working. Some of them have gone into teaching retailing at the college level. Uh, so that uh, these are ways, I think, in which you can measure the impact. Now, you've been very modest about the growth of the School of Retailing, uh, but going back just a step or two, as I remember it, uh, we came to have an extremely large and vigorous school. How did it compare with other schools? Of oh, yes, it was the largest, uh, the largest one in the country. And uh, I think that uh, larger than uh, New York University, which of course was a, eventually became a graduate school and now is no longer really uh, uh, the school of retailing. And uh, some of the others that uh, belong to the American Collegiate Retailing Association, we, uh, we really were the largest. And uh, of course, I think that unless you have someone, if I may comment this way, unless you have someone who is truly interested in the program and will push it, it will die. And this has been the case of the other schools. It died at the University of Pittsburgh. It's a dead duck at New York University. Uh, I could name about a half a dozen other colleges and universities around the country where at one time they had a vigorous ongoing program and were nationally known, and today they're not. And in most cases, it's because the person that really was had their heart and soul in it is no longer there. You've got to have somebody like that. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I don't say this is wrong. I say this is a sign of the times, really. Um, in what way do you feel that the Institute's personality has changed, if it has changed, over the years, the time you first came until the time of your retirement? Well, of course, you see, uh, I think the great change in personality took place when we went to the new campus. And uh, I think that uh, the Institute has now become a uh, highly respected, well-known uh, educational institution for work uh, in its fields of expertise. And uh, I'm sure that uh, with the new campus has contributed a great deal to this. It also has brought us some disadvantages, which uh, perhaps we shouldn't dwell on. But I, I think the minute that you do grow, it's like somebody who has been uh, rather poor most of their lives and suddenly uh, they win a lot of money in the lottery <laughs> and uh, they become well-to-do and their whole outlook changes. Uh, I think that uh, it's too bad if the Institute loses some of its individualized interest in, in students, in alumni, and in faculty members. Now, I don't know how you're going to solve that when you've got a big group of people you're working with, but there must be some way uh, to keep that personal touch, which to me has been the hallmark of RIT, the personal touch with its students, with its alumni, with its employers, with its friends in the community. This has been one of its great strengths, and it's unfortunate if we lose it. As we become larger, it appears that that might very well happen, too, oh, yes. unfortunately. Yes. I think, but I don't think you have to necessarily uh, feel, well, this is going to happen, there's nothing I can do about it. I think the administration can do something about it. it has to keep working on it. Number one, they have to recognize it, and then number two, they have to keep working at it. Uh, going back, uh, to some of the individuals that were prominent in the life of the Institute, who were some of the outstanding faculty members uh, that were on your uh, retailing school faculty and also your College of Business faculty, as you remember? Well, of course, uh, I remember uh, uh, George Barton, who uh, was uh, uh, very uh, active in the work in, in English and uh, these general studies courses and uh, left us, of course, to go on to other fields. I remember him very well. Of course, I have great affection for Dr. Tyler and Dr. Charters because I felt I learned a great deal from them. From Dr. Charters, I certainly learned that all the window shades should be at the same length in the windows across the front of the school. We ran around and did that before he came with us. I remember Georgie Hoke, who, uh, of course, uh, was a close friend of mine, but also I felt was a, a wonderful person uh, on our faculty. Ruth Cunningham, who has since passed away, was a member of the faculty in the School of Retailing. Uh, Gertrude Sykes did a great deal in those early days to develop curriculum. 
uh, Georgiana Hathaway, who gave me my first opportunity, and naturally I do remember her well. Um, president of the Institute, when I came across. Ms. Hogadon, unfortunately, we are coming to the end of this tape. I certainly want to thank you for the time that you've given me this morning. It's always a great pleasure to meet with you. Uh, undoubtedly, after this is transcribed, I would like to...